in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, we have been blessed by an amazing presentation. Um, I hope with this one will give some philosophical aspects of cosmology and also where the where the fight started. Why why does the science hate religion so much? So I would like to give the history of it. Um, in order to get into the context of, of why this hatred and, and see what happened. So we have to operate a couple of computers just to, to get the sound up there and the streaming as well. Um, our children are taunted and our face sometimes is shaken. Uh, so the, the witnessing for God has to involve um, answering questions. And the Bible tells us to be ready to give an answer. Um, I'll get into the, the topic, but I just wanted to give a context why the beginning of the world is an important question to answer. So, does Jesus exist? Did he resurrect? Um, we get taunted all when we celebrate Easter. Um, many parents approach us. The fathers here, Abuna Bolas and Abuna Daniel and myself, our kids are taunted in school. Did, 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 what is this resurrection? What's the point? So it turns out it's, it's very important to tackle this because there, it comes down to two, to two points. First, Jesus exists, which means does God exist? And is Jesus God? And then we can get into the resurrection. But we'll come into the toughest one, which is, one is easy. Jesus exists. I mean, historically, even people who deny the Bible and scrutinize the Bible, everybody call it a mythicist if he says Jesus didn't, as a man, didn't exist. So if God exists, then, then it can happen. The resurrection can happen if God exists. Because of what? Because of two things he did as a miracle. The resurrection is a miracle. Somebody wakes up by himself from the dead, that's a miracle. So in order to deny this miracle, I have to deny two main things, which is how life started and how the universe started. And that's why we study cosmology. It's not just a, a, a branching in science. It's not just interest in science. It's actually further than this. It is, it is because we are having to say, for the resurrection to happen, which is a miracle. And by the way, there is papers that thick that Noah cannot build an ark. There is no way he can get animals into the ark. Noah has to have so many knowledge of so many sciences um, in order to build the ark. But, but if building the ark is assisted by God, then it can happen. If the universe is created, then anything can happen. If life is given by God, then anything can happen. He can do anything. And that's why the two main challenges scientifically is that the origin of life is evolution and the world began by itself. And today we're focusing on the second one. This is where we're coming from. It is not just a gathering to discuss science. Abuna did a beautiful job, but the whole thing in our mind is to answer the question, the world has to have a beginning. And we have to prove this scientifically as Abuna did. And we'll try to tell you why tonight, there is a, why the science hates the church, because it has a history actually behind it. So science says the universe came by itself and evolution accounts for the origin of life because these are the two main miracles to get the universe out of nothing by God and to get life out of nothing by God. Then Noah can build an ark, Jesus can resurrect, you can open the Red Sea, all of these are plausible. So this is where we're coming from. Account for the creation, account for answering evolution helps our kids today when they are taunted about Noah, he could never build an ark. There's no way all of these animals fill the earth. There has to be an element of God on it. And the element of God can be used because we'll have to get, get back to the discussion, does God exist or not? This is why the two main themes that we focus on in defending the faith from outside the Bible is to answer that the universe has a beginning and the life, the beginning of life is not scientifically accounted for by evolution. Evolution exists very well, but it cannot explain the origin of life. There's a big difference between its existence, its definitely existence, the proof of an intelligent God, but it cannot explain how life started. 
but this was covered in the previous conference. It's, on, it's also, all of its talks are on orthodoxapologetics.org, orthodoxapologetics.org. I will not cover this, I'll cover it in brevity. Is there an, I call this the interface. The interface is what you have between a computer and a device. USB interface, printer interface. When you talk to different languages, you need to find a way to interface them together. Is there an interface between faith and science? It depends. I want to explain that very eloquently. It depends on who's interfering into the realm of the other. There are two different circles. The former is based on belief, but supported by initial eyewitnesses for the resurrection, for example while the latter is empirical by testing. When science makes a metaphysical, here is when the science starts poking into the faith, when science makes a metaphysical conclusion, physical is what you touch, metaphysical is what the conclusion about the physical, above the physical, that's metaphysical is, then it crossed its boundaries. So science, when it crosses the boundaries, when it makes a conclusion about science, especially now we're going to challenge this conclusion. This is the field I feel, I love most because using the science and digging to their, their statements and finding wrong, as we're gonna show today, especially, I was motivated by getting deeper and deeper in cosmology because of my love to somebody who gave me a book by one of the people we'll use today, A Universe Out of Nothing. Because I love that person very much, I really embarked very, very deep into debunking this thing as we're gonna see today. The faith has to answer sometimes philosophically and sometimes scientifically, as we did today. The first one may suit those who are in the faith already, but the second one is extremely needed with those of empirical community. We can't answer somebody, Coptic, non-Coptic. Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you. That's why fashioned the apologetics class into four levels. Level one, no use of the word God or church at all. All of the answers scientifically or philosophically or historically, or logically, or archaeologically. Level two, if we establish there is a creator, in which religion is he? We compare Christianity to others based on worldview. Then level three and four is basically the evangelism. How can I, of course, if it's God is in the Christianity, which Christianity is it? And then I get deeper into my faith. So the level, the first one is the toughest one. We have to tackle two main issues, evolution, empirically from the results that you're presenting cannot account for the beginning of life and also the universe cannot come out of nothing as we'll show scientifically, scientifically. Bear with this, I'm not going to present religion today. I'm actually going to present some very nice proofs that is easy to understand that life mathematically has to have a beginning. So the interface when the faith attack, when the science attacks the faith and says there is no God, because science finds the following, we we'll say, wait a minute, using that science, I'm going to prove to you that your science has gaps in it and the conclusions you're making are not right. So the conclusion that they became a fact in the scientific community as a reaction to this, people of faith came to the stage to defend. But the defense is not to answer science from the Bible because the Bible is not a scientific book, but rather to challenge the conclusions that scientists draw from their data. This challenge has to be scientific. The interface again between faith and science, this challenge has to be scientific by offering other plausible data than what they offer, by offering equally plausible conclusions about the data and, and or by showing that the conclusions are at large gap from the data. When they say evolution accounts for the origin of life or science, the beginning of the universe is started by itself. I'm going to show you how it couldn't scientifically. Scientific method is observation, then you make a hypothesis, then you make experimentation to test your hypothesis, and then you make conclusions. Science cosmology is very, very old. Pharaohs mastered this. And we have the star calendar from which Pope Demetrius XII actually used Ptolemy in Egypt and was able to calculate every year when, which week has the Passover feast and then which day of the week. And then after that, the Sunday becomes the feast of the resurrection. This comes actually from the very old, very old astronomy that we have in Egypt. Then Ptolemy shook the whole world when he 
started to, yes, he said that the, the center of the world is the earth. Yes, this is definitely is not the truth. But he came up with something very different is that we imagine it was imagined that everything is uniform in the world. And he came up with two terms, what is called different and equant. Without going into details, as he challenged getting, giving you this history in order to see where the crack between the science and the faith happened, where the sciences started to hit the church, and where this relativity came that we'll use very well into showing that the world has a beginning. After this, Copernicus came. Pope Leo X asked him to work on Julian calendar. Can you calculate for us? Can you, it has error, it has error. can you correct it? And Copernicus switched. He said, no, the Earth is not the center of the universe, it's the sun. It's called heliocentric universe. And he challenged the Ptolemaic view. And then the Earth is actually moving. Moving. The Earth is moving? Yes. This is where the, these major challenges uh, happened to the whole known idea of the space. Ptolemy, that things are not on a circular path. And then later on, Copernicus that, in fact, we are rotating around the sun. For us, this is, sounds like, ah, we know this already. But to suggest this then is you're crazy. You just have no idea how crazy you are. And I started preaching this. It's called the Copernican Principle. But the scientific community took, took it further and said, in fact, the Earth, opposite to what Abuna was telling us, in fact, the Earth, this is the part that affects us. Is it not a special location in the whole world? And the whole universe, there's nothing special about us, which led now that man is insignificant. We are one of billions and billions and billions of galaxies. So we are insignificant. That's important. We are insignificant. We're, we're nothing. In the, and the earth is nothing. And the universe is so big that the human person is nothing because the earth is not special. The earth is not special. This is where this all comes from, and it's called the Copernican Principle. Several scientists were going to um, yani, use them today, and here is their credentials. Bernard Carr from University of London, George Ellis from Cape Town, John Beale, Western University, John Hartnett, University of Adelaide, Australia, Julian, Max Principal, Lawrence Krauss, this is where the most famous theory, the universe out of nothing. And um, he is, in fact, answered very, very strongly. And this is uh, because one of our Coptic people I love has presented me with these books, and he's not believing in the church anymore. And that was about a year and a half ago. And I said, out of love, definitely, I have to embark on this. And so this man is a target of, of this uh, concept today. Pay attention to him because we're going to couple him with somebody else. His name is Villington, and we'll see how this will help us to understand the origin of the universe. Martin Silbert, Charles Sedon Foundation. Max Tegmark, that's a big, differ that's a big key because he's an atheist, PhD, MIT physicist that will change his view, and he's actually going to build the next observer that will go into space by 2020. These are events, by the way, built on 2003, 2008, 2013, things that happened. So very contemporary. Michio Kaku, you see him a lot on TV, giving physics stuff. I'm going to tell you right out now, all of this fine tuning that Abuna talked about, and it's very, very clear in the world. You know how he dismisses it? He says, we are one of billion universes. Our universe found itself able to continue, and the other died. This is, I can't believe this is a scientific explanation to fine tuning, because all of the testimony that Aruna gave about the fine tuning of the Earth we're living on, the only answer that science can find is we are one of billion universes that come in and out of existence, and ours was lucky that it continued. This is an explanation that's scientific. And unfortunately, it's accepted, but it's untestable. You cannot test multi-universe. So it's a very, very faith-based explanation to how the Earth is fine-tuned. And the head of this actually is Michio Kaku. And so many people, when they find more science describing how 
the earth is very fine tuned. This is the, the explanation they give. The solar system is just a lucky, we're lucky that our universe continued. Robert Bur uh, Burnett, Galileo was wrong, and another one, Robert Sanginus, also forming a book with him. I'm going a little bit in brevity. Ron Hatch, NAFCOM technology, anybody who, who needs to develop a GPS chip has to know very, very well about cosmology because it uses triangulation with satellites and has to know very well. So what does evolution have to do with the beginning of the world? It's called the nebular theory. And basically the nebular theory is after the big bang, hot gas in the middle formed the sun and the rocks or the outside of these gases started to cool down and they became rocks. Just to let you know, this is what people believe, how the world came up also in an evolution way. And this happened about 4.5 to 4.6 billion years ago. The gas in the middle formed the sun. The gas around the middle started to condense into grains of dust on its own. The grains of dust started to come together to form clumps. Clumps from into, I'm reading scientific explanation of how the world after the Big Bang developed. This is science, believe me. Into rocks with other rocks clinging to it started forming large rocks. After a long time, they became huge asteroids or planetismals. Planetismals are the small things that will form planet. The little parts which will form into planets. Here is a picture of it. So the gas in the middle and these rocks forming around it, they get together, they form bigger and bigger. And then they become the planets. This is, this is extremely scientifically unbelievably weak. How are the planets so different? If you look at the solar system, you see Venus and Earth very close to one another. One is very, 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 very hot, uninhabitable, exactly the same size, exactly. One is us, very inhabitable, and the other is like a green, green, greenhouse effect. You, you can't live on it. It's, it's, it's very, very hot. How are these formed by this theory? Here is because they see in the other galaxies hot in the middle and rocks rotating around. So it says, ah, this is how our whole solar system is formed. As I'm going to touch on this, the outer planets after Earth and the ones with Earth before it are completely different. And each one is completely different. In fact, Saturn has, has two moons that dance, they call it the dancing moons. They switch their orbit on their own every four years for no re unknown reason. Just let's switch. <laughs> Why? It's, I can't, I'm not going to present God here, but here's an evidence. Can such just forming rocks, it's called gravitational accretion. Like by gravity, these rocks are getting together and all of us have become these planets and these planets look so different. That's it. This is the explanation. This is a scientific explanation for the forming of the system that we're living in. So here is example of these statements of people who are nothing. Just to, to show the scientists are coming from the following point of view. We are nothing in comparison to the splendid universe. We are nothing special. Earth is not special because if Earth were special, then we get into why, not how. A book, a universe out of nothing. Please remember this. I read the very first pages, very first chapters of it, which is Lawrence Krauss, which is exactly why I got deeper into this field, to, for, that, for that person. Very initially, he switches the argument for the universe from why to how, because it's very pleasantly, we didn't, we didn't revise our, our presentations together, but it's exactly the same thing. Why the universe is created is the question, but any scientist doesn't care about the why, he will not want to ask the why, it always switches to the how. How it was created, because it's just a machine. And one of the explanations is the solar nebular theory, which is the gravitational accretion. Max Tegmark, MIT, we are supposed to research, not follow a certain book. Of course, we know what he means by that book. Or a certain authority telling me something. We got our arrogance knocked out of us. We humans have to be humble and ask mother nature. That's exactly contradictory when you ask mother nature, then somebody's designing the world. So the scientists get this donation, not donation, get these grants because they have to be atheists in, in order to get grants, in order to do correct science. Very early, people actually in their knowledge of cosmology started to 
locate and to mark with archaeology what they observed about the location of the sun relative to the earth. So in the summer, as the sun rotates, not rotates, perceived rotating relative to the earth in this orbit and then switches to the winter and so on. Then we have in England, as you all know, this artifact that records this. So people have been looking at the sky and studying it forever. I wanted to give you the history in order to get how we reach today, the state we're at. Tycho Brahe, later on, it says that the planets orbit the sun. So Copernicus started to become the de facto standard where heliocentric. So the planets orbit the sun, but the sun orbits the earth. So he's now confused himself between Ptolemy and Copernicus. And he made tremendous number of observations. Come the most famous Kepler, Johann Kepler, who's the assistant of Tycho Brahe and said the must the sun must be the entity that is responsible for the motion of the planets. These people are brilliant. With no technology that we have today, that just by their observation, but just mere telescopes and unlimited hours of observation. To come up with these statements is unbelievably brilliant. So Kepler, who took all of the observations of Tycho Brahe, said that this, the sun is actually the center and the sun is responsible. He didn't know how, but we're going to see how by, by, by with, with time as we get into the history. This set the latter stage on in the 1600s for Isaac Newton theories. So now there is no animosity between the church and science, everybody in his own field. So we have Tycho Brahe and then Kepler. Galileo. Galileo observing this very heavy, very heavy planet, humongous planet, Jupiter. He found there is four moons rotating around this planet. Actually, these four moons are very amazingly to study. And when he looked at them, he said, definitely the smaller rotates around the bigger. And he started forming this rotation of the Earth. Galileo, the heliocentric universe and the Earth movement, the church hated this. There is now the beginning of the collision, very hard collision. This marked the battle between science and the church, observational science battling the church theology, which was not done in the East at all. He wrote a letter to his friend Francisco Rodicini, who introduced Giovanni Perioni to Galileo. So... Francesco introduced another person who agrees with Galileo. His name is Giovanni Prioni. Hey, somebody really agrees with this and he made observations. Galileo, after 30 years holding on to his theory, in order to get accepted by the church, he wrote a letter back to his friend, Redocini, and told him, I no longer believe in this theory. What did Redocini do? He erased the signature of Galileo. Because he said, there is no way he should succumb this way to the church and forget his scientific evidence. Giordano Bruno came after him, very feisty guy. He insisted on the theory, so the church burned him. He was burned in the streets of Rome in 1600 AD, and he said to the Pope, it may be true that you fear me to deliver judgment on me, that I, then I fear judgment. This marked, and it took to any atheist, it says, church burns scientists. Church burns science. This is exactly the, the, the holy creed of scientists. They always come up with this example. And this example, of course, is valid. But I wanted to give you the history of why, where this fork in the road happened. Although many of these scientists were very religious and they were learning in institutions funded by the church, the universities were funded by the church. But when the church started to immerse, to remove any observation to be opposite to the Bible, then the person has to be burned. It marked then the fork that there is no coincidence or any interaction between science and religion. We have to kill the religion in order for science to flourish. This is the only way for science to flourish is to kill the faith. You see where the animosity came from? It came from this. The, the incident of burning the scientist in the streets of Rome in 1600. I had to give you this history in order to know where the brewing came from. This became now, if you want to do science, you have to kill the church. You have to kill theology. 
Newton wasn't like this, but not all of the scientists did that. But it was a very bad, um, very bad incident and precedence. So the, the E is missing here. So Isaac Newton said space is absolute. So I'm going to get into a little bit now of how we reach relativity because it will help us to answer Lawrence Krauss, who says the universe came out of nothing. Because I want to take you through not the deep math, but through the way of thinking. This is important to remember as concepts that it never leaves. How did you get there? To make you understand it. The space is absolute. It's confined. It's not infinite. Laws, gravity. Newton is the god of gravity. <laughs> And without him, we would not have designed anything that moves or any building or anything without his understanding of the Newtonian, our understanding of the Newtonian mechanics. He developed the laws of gravitational forces between any two masses. So let's think how science is progressing now. We have now great jumps, great jumps. We're now establishing that the Earth is moving around a heliocentric system. We're now establishing that the Earth can move. We're now establishing that Newton comes up with how are these planets attracted to one another? So he comes up with gravity. And these are all believers. And he said the masses rotate around their center of mass. So if the sun is so big and the earth is so small, the center of gravity would be in the sun. One of the two objects can occupy the location of the center of mass being much bigger than the other. And he published this in something called Principia Mathematica. Here is an experiment that he did. In order to, to say that motion is absolute, not, there's nothing, nothing about relativity at all. This, this word didn't exist. So he hung a bucket in his room. And then he rotated this bucket with a, with a rope. So it had enough energy in it. And then he let it go. As soon as you let go of the bucket, the water stays flat. So the bucket is rotating very fast, but the water is still flat. At the very end, the water has the same speed like the bucket, which means the relative speed between them is, is zero, because the water is at the same speed, and the water curves. So it says, you see, I prove to you that motion is absolute, not relative, because when the relative motion was very high, which is at the very beginning, the bucket is rotating very quickly, and the earth and the water is flat, the, the, the surface is still the same. And when the relative motion was zero, because the water is rotating the same speed as the bucket, the water curved. Therefore, motion is absolute. Are you following the trend here? Because the word relativity will be a shocking word, and which is we live by today. Mark came and said, motion is relative. From some observations, I will not get into it, but he's the first, not Newton, he's the first person who came out of his mouth this word relative. And he introduced this new way of thinking. The first one to mention relativity, each moving relative to the universe or vice versa. Earth moving relative to the universe or vice versa. Rotation is relative. This was like completely unprecedented. You cannot measure whether you are rotating or the universe is rotating. This will create the same effect. In fact, this makes us perceive the Earth as oblique. All theoretically. Not a perfect sphere. You can look at this from the Ptolemaic or Copernican. He strongly paved the way to the theory of relativity. So Newton know, knew about these people. He's the, but he's the first one who moved from, sorry, Albert Einstein knew about these people. So he's the first one to move from the word absolute, which Newton, nobody can, can debate with Newton. He's the god of mechanics because of relativity. and can explain every single planet rotating around the sun, except one, by the way. And this is what we'll talk about it later when, when two scientists get together. In fact, this makes us perceive the Earth as oblique, not as perfect sphere. You can look at this from Ptolemaic or Copernican. Ptolemaic means that the Earth is the center. Copernican means that the Sun is the center. He strongly paved the way to the theory of relativity. So it's Mach. Motion is relative. You cannot tell by measuring centrifugal and inertial forces whether you are moving or what you are measuring is moving. The most ex important experience experiment in history is called the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887. They tried to prove this. So kind of, I mean, the details of it is not important, but a certain light ray emitted in the direction of the motion of the Earth and another light ray emitted perpendicular to the motion. If we observe them later on, they have to have difference between them. And they made this experiment, which is on the right-hand side here. 
when they measure that there is no difference between the light rays, then the Earth is not moving. We sent a ray in the direction of the motion of the Earth and another ray perpendicular to the motion of the Earth. We observed both of them and they came back at the same time, then the Earth is not moving. Yeah, but all what we know about science is not, is not true. Is the Earth is not moving? Till Lorenz, the measuring, he said, he said this amazing statement. The measuring arm of the apparatus was being compressed by the ether in the direction of motion, just enough to make it look like we are standing still. So Lorenz explained to Michelson, who got very depressed, because he says this conclusion directly contradicts the explanation which presupposes that the Earth moves. So Lorenz explained and said, no, 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 no. In space, I don't know how he got this idea, but Lorenz is really the father of the special theory of relativity, which is, we're gonna talk about Einstein very, very soon, because this is very important how the world started. He said, no, 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 measuring things in space is, can be compressed or expanded. That's why these two rays came back at the same time. Along the motion, the distance was being compressed shorter, hence the two rays were not offset from one another. So in space, things can, as they move, time can change. That's the Lorenz, Lorenz experience and experimentation and, th and, and, and mathematics. So Einstein now came into very, very rich thinking of Mach and Lorenz that things could be relative. So he started to say, I have come to believe that the motion of the earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment. And he wrote this book, The Evolution of Physics, The Special Theory of Relativity. And he said, motion is relative. Motion in space is associated with contraction in length, decrease in time in travel, and increase in mass all at the same time. And he called this, out of honesty, the Lorentz transform. He was, not, he was not stealing the idea. He called it the Lorentz transform. Because the main, the main person who was able to explain to Michelson, Matizalsha, Michelson, don't worry. I can tell you why, Habibullah, that the same came at the same time. It's because in space, things can change in length and time can change. That's why even if you do it differently, the, the measurement apparatus will not be enough to do it. The, com the compression of one compared to the other will make them arrive at the same time. And he called it the Lorentz transform or Einstein special theory of relativity. Nothing mentioned about God here, nothing atheistic. But we're gonna see how this plays in the beginning of the world, just bear with me, it's coming. So the most profound, the most profound thing that came into cosmology and into physics is the struggle so violent in the early days of science between Ptolemy and Copernicus. That's why I had to mention to, to you who's Ptolemy, what did he do, and Copernicus. One said that the Earth is, stand, is stationary and the sun moves, that's Ptolemy. Copernicus said it's heliocentric, the sun is stationary and the Earth is moving. Einstein said, in terms of relativity, they are both right. It doesn't matter. The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would then be quite meaningless. Each coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest would simply mean two different conventions, which is your reference. That's basically what he's saying here. This is equal to this mathematically. Two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. Now we're in a completely different ball game compared to Newton. Now we have more and more stuff that's happening back in this century. I ask for God's help with this couple of slides. <laughs> um, this equation on top there, he, Einstein in his brilliance came up with an equation um, that's called tensor equation. Tensor, you have as a vector, you have the matrix, and you have multiple matrices that set tensor. And each, these equations are, it's called differential equations, and they have to be solved sim simultaneously, all of them. So it's, it's impossible unless you put some special cases to solve it. But he contributed two main things. The general theory of relativity and the expansion, that's not his contribution, but somebody will look at these equations and tell them, wait a minute, what you just wrote means something unbelievable. 
that will lead into, by the way, the Big Bang in a couple of slides. The most important thing is that, what is the general theory of relativity? In England, this is during World War II. In England, there is a scientist, a great measurement scientist called Sir Arthur Eddington. And this German or Swiss living in Germany because he was called to help with the war and it was his science and to beat the science of the British. So Eddington is very, very humble. He said all of the planets could be explained by Newtonian mechanics except one. Mercury. So he sent a letter to Einstein. So the Mercury, what's up with Mercury? And Einstein was so surprised. Based on this letter, he sat with Max Planck and developed the theory of relativity. The theory of relativity, as this picture shows, means that the gravity is no longer a force. The gravity is a field. For the sake of time, we're going to do something fun, but uh, I'll have probably to skip it maybe at the end. But I, can we do it? Come, come, come. So we have a sheet here, not to sleep, a sheet to represent what Einstein said, that uh, space and time are a flat sheet. And then and then a heavy object like the sun You put it in the middle, it distorts this field. So it's no longer gravity force, but it's describing it as a relative field of gravity, then that's why things in space don't move in straight lines, they curve. Because the heavy object in the middle distorted the field. So all the Newtonian, thank you very much for the demonstration. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's probably the most interesting thing in the talk. So. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm just want to give you this history and because it will lead to what we're discovering. So now the whole classic gravity force has changed into a field. In the 20th century, we have electromagnetic fields, gravity fields, magnetic fields, which led people to find something called, can we find one field that describes all, and this is where came the string theory, and then people said the string theory account for the creation of the world. All of this is coming from here. But of course, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not true. But, so the general theory of relativity means that space now is curved, not straight. And things in space act based on the field, not because of forces. And by this, he was able to explain why Mercury had a different orbit than what was expected by Newton. What helped him in this is Sir Arthur, Arthur Eddington, who, the story is, is unbelievable. He said, if Newton is correct, then the sun will curve light because things are curved. So if I see a certain star in darkness, and if I see that star in light, the position of the star will be different, which is this. So the sun will curve, will make, because the light is curving because of the sun here, he wants to prove it. So this is the actual location of the star and I will see it, I will see it here. But how can I prove this? I can't look at the sun. So he needs what? An eclipse. So he travels to Africa, May 1919, and he does a measurement where he observes certain stars at night, and he observes these stars at what? An eclipse, because now the sun is there. So if the star's location change, then Einstein is right. Then really light is curving, because when the sun is there, I see the star in a different location. And the only way you can look at the sun and observe a star is when there's what? A solar eclipse which is exactly what he did. This is, this is one of these location, these two dots that are next to one another, each of them is actually the same object seen at night and seen at eclipse. And he found it not congruent, not the same. He did this with a telescope in the eclipse for just five minutes measuring. And when it was at night, he measured it and he compared it. 
And he said, the sun is doing a gravitational lens because lens can, that's why I call it a gravitational lens because lens can, can change the direction or the path of light. And what we said, what we did here by the gravitational field is that the sun is acting as a gravitational lens. So the objects distort the field and the other smaller objects rotate in that field based on how it was distorted. No longer gravitational forces or Newtonian mechanics are used in space. So now physics has a great triumph. We know when to apply Newton and when we know when to apply Einstein and we know the boundary between the two, when to switch. This is a major triumph in the cosmology. So that's the gravitational field. Second one is very, very important, which is this equation. Somebody looked at this equation, a priest looked at this equation, by the way. Here he is, Father Georges Lemaitre. I said, Einstein, this equation means that the universe is expanding. Expanding, the biggest word in science at that time was called steady state, everything is steady. What do you mean the universe is expanding? So Einstein not insultingly told the priest, your math is impeccable, but your physics is garbage. And it turned out the father of the Big Bang is a priest because he described the Big Bang. The Big Bang was the name given by Hoyle in that interview. But this is the Big Bang, is that he told him, Einstein, your equation shows that the universe is not in steady state. And the main physics in the whole world, this was in 1927 in a conference in Lausanne, was about steady state. So Einstein fudged it. He put something called lambda in it in order to keep it steady, because this is expanding according to the equation. He said, I want to keep it not expanding. So he put lambda. And later on, he said, what Abuna said, lambda is my biggest blunder of my life, which means I did a mistake. I shouldn't have put it. Everything you know about the, big, about the expansion of the universe is ascribed to Friedman in order not to put the name of the priest, Lemaitre. Everything they ascribe in science, you will not find the, word, the name of George Lemaitre. You'll find Friedman, who's a Russian scientist, who also told Einstein the same equation. Your wonderful equations describe an expanding universe. But it was Father George Lemaitre who was the independently first one to, and he published papers. This was a physicist, PhD in physics. He has a very nice story. He went to World War I, and he, his father, he went to engineering to help his father, and when he went, went to World War I and came very close to death, he said, I want to do what I like. He went back and did mathematics and physics, and he loved God so much. He got ordained a priest, and then he mixed the two together that he wanted to really, his physics led to the creation. When he looked at the equation of, so what is this world coming from? Nothing. We're going to get there. In the United States, Europe has no money. The war is eating everything. So they use mathematics. The United States has a lot of money because especially in the World War II, United States came, came back from being 17th in the, in the world in manufacturing to be number one because they had to help Japan and England in the war against the Nazis. So this led to Hubble, Edwin Hubble, build a telescope, which is Abuna talked about, the Hubble telescope, and he looked at the galaxies. So now independently, Einstein, by Lemaitre looking at his equation, by Friedman looking at his equation, there is, his math says that the universe is expanding. By the way, this is a very important statement because if it's expanding, then yesterday it had a smaller size than today, and the day before it has a smaller size than yesterday, and, the day, and so on, until you go very back to come to a point, which is the Big Bang, which is creation by God from an instance. So the expansion of the universe discovered by that priest, discovered by Friedman, is an amazing discovery by the equations of Einstein, who put these equations because the gravity became a field. Now it's like the history of it is unbelievably amazing. So Hubble, when he looked at that with his telescope, he said, there's billions of galaxies, and there's something called redshift. The further galaxies appear redder than the closer ones. Why? Why the further ones are redder? So the redshift means that the galaxies that are further appear more red than those that are close by. That's what he called, called it the redshift. Their number is, their color is shifting to more red. 
And he came up with the Hubble constant, very important constant in whole cosmology. The velocity equals Hubble constant time distance. You can estimate actually how far these galaxies and how fast, how fast they are moving away from us. So a galaxy two times away from us moves two times faster than a galaxy one time away from us. So the, the universe is not only expanding, expanding faster at the edges. As if a huge explosion happened that everything is moving away from one another. This is the discovery by Hubble for experimentation. And by theory, by Einstein, supported by Lemaitre, supported by Friedman. Who well, Einstein did it, observed it, but Friedman and, Ein and Hubble observed it. Uh, Friedman and Lemaitre observed it. Okay. So he put this lambda to adjust it. Here is the redshift. Things moving away from me appear redder. Things moving closer to me appear, appear bluer. To symbolize it, imagine you put a loaf of bread with raisins in it. In, in an oven, when it, when it expands, the raisins will move further from one another. That is what our universe is doing. So in the past, it was closer. In the past, it was closer and so on. So things, when they get further, their wavelength gets further. And the red has a larger wavelength than the blue or the violet. That's why farther things appear redder. So this Hubble discovered now by experimentation, without doubt, our universe had an explosion before. It is now what we see, it's moving away from one another. Mr. Lawrence Klaus, the Hubble constant is extremely important because once we know how far a million light years galaxy is moving, simple physics would tell us how long ago we were together. That's how we can estimate the life of the universe. So how long ago was the Big Bang? Because we can measure by that constant the velocity, then we can measure the distance, and we can know how far all of these were in one place together. This is what these um, satellites get sent in order to measure the redshift, like the Hubble telescope, for example. And then we can measure from it that estimated the world started 13.7 billion years ago. So Hubble quotes, such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous in a sense to the ancient conception of a central Earth. Remember, scientists, if we say that the Earth is a special position, that's a big no, because it means it has put it in that position by God. So he says the following, this hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it's unwelcomed, and only can be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomenon in order to fit the data of the experimentation. But we should never accept that our Earth is in a certain special position. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. <laughs> That's not science. So notice scientists, when they find something pointing that the Earth could be in a certain special position, we have to disregard it, because this means what? It put, it's put there by someone. So he is quoting, him, he's, he's quoted here, the unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. As scientists, we should never accept this explanation. We have to find another one. But the data shows that everything is expanding away. So they come up with, or the model now for the cosmology is the following. The matter is 4%, which is all of the galaxies, all of the, all of the systems, all of the rocks in the world form the matter that's 4.9. These are held together in this rotation, like our solar system, by what's called dark matter. Dark means that we don't know what it is, so we call it dark. This is exactly what the dark is. So within a galaxy, there is matter. That's the planets and all of the suns, all of the moons. They are held together by dark matter. Galaxies are pushed from one another, which is what Hubble found, by dark energy. And it turns out dark energy is the estimated 68% of the universe. This is the explanation, plausible explanation to science. They call it dark. They don't know what it is. But this is what's pushing these galaxies away from one another. Here is uh, Mr. Krauss that wrote that book. And I want you to quote it because this is the reason some of the cops or some of the youth turns to atheism because of this book, A Universe Out of Nothing. So here it is. Based on this history, now we know this expansion. We know where it came from. We know mathematically by Einstein and the looking into the equation, we know experimentally by Hubble, how, this is how we come to today. This is how we come to today. Today, based on this picture, everybody acknowledges we came from a point because experimentation cannot be denied, we're expanding. 
But he says the dominant stuff of the universe is nothing. And we do not understand it. Understand it. Lawrence Krauss modifies it and states, nothing is not really nothing. But infinite particles that pop in and out of existence on a time scale so short that you cannot actually see them. All of this, they call it what, a hair or counting angels on a pin, edge of a pin or something. So he came up with, the, the, all of these are mechanics of, of, the, of the atom, things coming in and out of existence. You might say, if you cannot see them pop in and out of existence, then it's not physics, it's philosophy, it's faith. Although we cannot see them directly, but they do not have an impact on atoms and the structure of the atoms. He says, again, by his own mouth in videos, I have found for him, nothing is not nothing. Nothing is nothing plus energy and the law of gravity. Okay, hold on. This is what exactly what we're talking about. There has to be laws that bring this nothing into something. Wait a minute. So Lawrence Krauss, who published this book, is saying it's not just nothing. It's nothing plus laws. Okay. Nothing plus laws. <laughs> You're playing with us. Who put these laws? No answer. The laws, where did it come from? In his, in his, not this, in his book, Universe Out of Nothing, the part that I read for it, he shifts the focus from, from why the universe is existing to how. Because once you ask why, there is a purpose. As I want to explain, there is a purpose for the universe. And scientists dodge the why, they focus on the how. And if you dig deeper into the how, it comes out to statements like this. It's out of nothing, but you come push them. No, it's nothing plus some laws put there. Yeah, there are some laws. Uh, you have to answer me where it comes from. Mr. Michiko Kako loves this multiverse. It, believe me, this is what he says. It's like a soup. Nothing is for me. Subatomic particles are popping in and out of existence. If sub if subatomic particles do this, then why universes don't do this? He's applying what's subatomic to the atom, to the whole universe. Why? Because he, they want to get rid of the point that our universe is tailored perfectly for our existence, the Earth. Habibi, you're going to hear always this theory. Multiverse is untestable. Multiverse like the kitchen sink. Put anything in it and you can't test it. It's like multiverse. We're, we're just the lucky ones. Other universes started and ended on their own. Can you prove it? Can you, can you test it? Can you? No. And then what do we hear? Is that we have no proof that God created the universe. Well, look at the opposite. We have a proof. Observable sciences, the world is expanding. By theory, by mathematics, which I told you the history, why they, how they got there, that's why I spent time at the beginning, and by experimentation by Hubble. But people who have the faith of atheism come up with two things. Universe come out of nothing, you push them to the limit, like Lawrence Krauss. No, 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 it's not nothing. There is something with it. Laws are with it. Laws, where did they come from? The other one says, we're one of billion universes and we're the lucky one. Our universe came by evolution. It started and it was very favorable and it continued. That is, that is not science. That is not science. Big bangs happen all the time, but most of them don't result into anything. But our universe popped out and kept going. Hello, this is very nice. <laughs> I am reading for somebody who has regular shows. You know this person, right? He has regular shows on TV, probably paid through the nose, in order to advertise this. I can't call it science. This is magic. And these are, listen to this one. Um, no, that it didn't go further. Sorry, because this one is not matching. Okay, this is um, Bord, Guth, and Villinken, the BGV theory. And he's Villinken, Alexander Villinken, and Guth is MIT. I can't remember Bord is from where. He's saying exactly, the, listen to what he's saying and we'll analyze it. Alex, uh, literally all my life I've been obsessed by the question of why there's anything at all. Um, and you've addressed certainly one of the subset questions, why this universe, how this universe can emerge literally from the, 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 the nothingness of, uh, of, uh, of 
the laws of physics. How does that occur and what is the deep significance of that? Um, the, uh, uh, if, if it, the universe uh, can, uh, has some matter content and it has space and time. So the question is how all this came into being. Um, and uh, you could think that uh, it's impossible for the universe to originate out of the state with no universe simply because of energy conservation. Um, matter has positive energy and uh, that is conserved. This is one of the fundamental laws of nature. Um, however, uh, another fundamental fact is that the energy of gravitational field is negative. And uh, if you have a closed universe, that is the universe such that the space closes on itself, uh, just like, the, in a, like a sphere, uh, then you can show that in such a universe, the negative energy of gravity exactly compensates the positive energy of matter. So the total energy of such a universe is zero. Uh, and other uh, quantities that are conserved, like electric charge, for example, you can also show that they must be zero. Like if you put a positive charge in this spherical universe, you can follow the line of electric force and they have to converge on another side and have a negative charge. So the total charge of a closed universe must be zero. Then, if all conserved quantities in such a universe are equal to zero, uh, then there is uh, no conservation law forbids creation of such a universe out of nothing, out of state where there is no matter, no space, and no time. Um, and in quantum mechanics, anything that is not forbidden by conservation laws happens with some probability. Uh, so that's basically why uh, a closed universe can spontaneously nucleate in quantum theory of gravity. Uh, and in fact, there is an elegant mathematical description of this process where you can try to uh, do a calculation to, uh, and try to uh, figure out what the initial state of the universe is most likely to be in when it nucleates. And how does quantum tunneling uh, relate to that? Um, the, uh, if, you, if you consider a universe uh, filled with some, well, I should say that uh, if you, even if you don't have any matter in the usual sense, uh, like particles and so forth, there is still vacuum. And for physicists, vacuum is a, is a state which has energy and pressure. Uh, we live in a vacuum with a particular low energy, but still not zero. Uh, but uh, there are other vacua which have high energy, and that's presumably the vacuum that drove inflationary expansion in the early history of the universe. So when this closed universe forms, it is filled with one of these vacua. Um, and if you uh, solve the uh, Einstein's equations for a universe filled with vacuum, you discover that it, uh, it describes a contracting and re-expanding universe. It kind of bounces at some small size. It cannot go smaller than that size. So that, that is classically forbidden according to classical Einstein's equations. However, in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, things that are classically forbidden by energy barriers can happen by tunneling through energy barriers. So if you have a universe of zero size, that is no universe at all, that can tunnel through energy barrier to this minimum size and start expanding. So in this classical solution of contracting and re-expanding universe, only the expanding part exists. And uh, before that, you can have tunneling. So quantum mechanics gets you from zero to this small size, and once you get to this small size, then you're able to, 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 to use general relativity and Einstein theory to, to generate all the rest. Right. Now, this is remarkable and, and awesome, uh, but it is not something from nothing because you're starting with the laws of quantum physics, you're starting with the laws of general relativity. I mean, there's a lot of somethings there. This vacuum you talk about, as you said, is, is, is pulsing with energy and fluctuations and pressure and all sorts of things. I mean, there's a lot there. That's true, but uh, I'm not starting with the vacuum, right? Vacuum is what comes out of it. So uh, what I'm starting with are, indeed, 
the laws of physics, of general relativity and quantum mechanics. And uh, of course, uh, and these laws are assumed to exist in some sense, in some platonic sense, uh, even prior to the universe, although prior I should put in quotation marks because there is no time. Um, and the question, uh, of course, is an extremely intriguing question of why these laws, who gives the laws, um, it's uh, a deep mystery, and um, I don't have much to say about that. I would like to. <laughs> this is not a chum change scientist. This is really, uh, I will have to keep this for another time and just wrap it up, but there is build up on this. Uh, Alexander Willinken, and he has actually exchanged with Lawrence Krauss, and Lawrence Krauss modified his email. There is so much going on, but the target of this talk really is to give enough rigor, enough foundation, enough substance to get us to the point that the beginning of the universe had to have something, even if it was nothing. Lawrence Krauss admits it, nothing is not just nothing, nothing is nothing plus laws of gravity. Willington says quantum mechanics, gravitational balance or equilibrium, conservation of energy that makes this come into existence, which I represented here by three stages. First stage is nothing, but you have to have energy conservation laws and gravitational laws, which he says, I would love to know where they came from. Willinken, not any person. And then quantum mechanics laws takes us which what they call tunneling without damaging the conservation of energy can get you into a universe. And then Einstein takes this over and becomes expanding universe. And then of course the fine tuning, but this is a few, if you talk pure science, how the earth came and formed based on the equations, based on Hubble, based on even Lawrence Krauss, who doesn't want to admit that when he says nothing, it's just the front of the book. Honestly, I feel so bad. I feel I'm so <laughs> tired, so sad. And, and this is where I, I really wanted to give you, even if you don't remember much, but remember the history of cosmology. Remember that, that, that we reached both camps, the United States and Europe, about the expansion of the universe. And before this, scientists when use physics, they come to say there has to be laws existing for this beginning to happen. And this is exactly where we can never tell any scientists, you have given us enough evidence with the nebular theory, how the universe came into existence. So um, there is other discovery that's based on on sending some probes in the space, but I think when, uh, we'll, we'll keep this for another another talk. I just wanted to leave you really with this, you know, with these three stages of the modeling of the universe and with the statement of a scientist that it cannot come out of nothing that even if mathematically we can prove it, but this nothingness had to have laws existing, which by experimentation, looking into the expansion, looking into the Hubble constant, which can tell us when it started. Do not be fooled by that statement of Lawrence Krauss, universe came out of nothing. After some observations happen, but the time will not permit to do it, I wanted to share the switch in the statements of Krauss and the switch in the statements of Max Tigmark of MIT, but um, I will be keeping you very little. I'll, I'll end here. And thank you very, 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 very much for your presence. I hope we have presented something. Um, <laughs> th thanks to Abuna and, uh, and, and really your presence here late. And God willing, we'll build up on this. Uh, we'll revisit it. And I just wanted to protect your mind when you present it from things like this. We, we f figure out that scientifically it's not plausible. Uh, and remember these two facts. They switch the why into the how, because they don't want to see why the universe was created. It has a purpose. Second thing, they, they, they fool you that the beginning was nothing, but it was nothing plus laws. And 
scientists, all of them agree that these laws had to exist, but nobody mentions it honestly. Okay, Abuna Bulis will pray for us. Thank you all very, very much.